there's enough, not just love, I'm talking about agape love. We're going to learn about agape love in a minute. So God is agape. Whoever lives in agape lives in God and not in them. There is no fear in agape. Okay? But perfect agape love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. So the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Amen? So what is this agape? Right? What is this agape? Well, first of all, it says that this God kind of love, it's a different love. This love that God loves you with. This agape love, because God is agape. This kind of God love, it drives out fear. So if there's fear in your house, if you guys begin to learn how to love like God, that fear is going to go. When you begin to understand that God agapes you, He loves you, it's not just any type of love, it's an agape love. When you begin to understand what agape means, that you truly are loved, it's going to change your whole life. And then fear has to go out the back door of your home. Fear has to go out the back door of your marriage when the two of you begin to understand agape love, right? Right? So agape love is so powerful, it drives out all fear. And it says in the scripture here, perfect love drives out all fear because fear has to do with punishment. What is punishment? It is negative consequences. So let's look at that for a minute. Negative consequences. So think about it in your relationships. When have you been afraid to be totally you? That's fear. When have you decided you were going to wear a mask and not show your whole self to somebody? That's because of fear. When in your relationships have you decided, for example, you were, you know, um, you were afraid to tell the truth? Maybe in, in a particular relationship, you decided that you were going to tell this person they were going through something, you understood something about their life, but you told them 90% of it but left out the other 10 because of fear. So fear impacts our relationships, right? Because we believe somehow there's a negative consequence, right? That's why we're afraid. And so God wants us to get to that place. Now how did fear enter the relationships back to Adam and Eve? Sin came in, right? Adam rebelled against God. What did Adam do? He blamed Eve. He said, God, why did you give me this woman? And oh, by the way, she made me eat the apple. And then Eve said, he did it. It's his fault, right? So you start blaming each other, right? So from the Garden of Eden, what we see is when sin comes in, sin breaks down relationships and there's fear. They were hiding from God. God found them, right? God always shows up in your life, right? And so they were running, and God found them, and then they started blaming each other, right? They were afraid, right? And so then there was negativity. Then there was, you know, all, all kinds of things. They disapproved of each other. They became distant. They were defensive. All of these things. So that's what fear does to relationships. So God wants us to get into a place where we're operating and a godly love. And guess what? The best place to learn that is in the church. The best place to learn that is with God. And so that's why it's so powerful as a married couple to be in the church. So what are two characteristics of God's agape love? You can go on forever, but I'm going to give you two. Number one, God's love is consistent. So God doesn't decide one day, well, I'm going to love Pastor Sandy. And then tomorrow I'll say, ah, I don't really love Pastor Sandy. In fact, she didn't preach so well on Sunday. I guess I don't like her as much anymore. No. God loves me today the same that he's always loved me. There's nothing I can do to change his love, and there's nothing that will diminish his love. He loves me. It's consistent. It will never change. Do you know that there's nothing you can do to make God love you? Well, I'll become a Christian because I want God to love me more. No. You don't have to become a Christian. You become a Christian to accept the free gift of salvation. You're not going to make God love you more. He loved us while we were yet sinners. So God loves you. It's consistent. It will never change. God's not fickle. He doesn't decide, well, you know, I don't really like you today. I, I don't really love you today. I guess you're on your own. No, God loves you consistently, always the same, always greatly, always amazing love, always this foundation of agape love. Amen? Yeah. And so if you get a hold of that, you begin to realize there's nothing I can do that will separate me from the love of God. Amen? Number two is that God's love is unconditional. And this is so powerful. God loves you unconditionally. So God doesn't say, I 
So God doesn't just love you because of things that you do. Well, I didn't pray yesterday. Or I skipped my quiet time. I didn't have my devotionals. Pastor Sandy's going to be upset with me. Maybe Pastor Sandy will be, but God isn't. God's love for you doesn't change. It's not going to change because you have your quiet time. It's not going to change because you pray. It's not going to change because you pray for five hours or one hour or one minute. It doesn't change. God loves you, period. There's nothing you can do to make Him love you more. Now, let me tell you this. You can get God's favor, and that's a whole different thing. God will give you His favor when you begin to love Him and seek after Him and walk, it, walk with Him. That's a whole other thing, but God loves you. His love is unconditional. So I want to encourage you to learn how to love your spouse, your friends consistently, unconditionally. You love them in the good days, you love them in the bad days. You love them when they're nice, you love them when they're going through menopause. I mean, with their... <laughs> you love them when they're messed up, you love them when they're making bad decisions. You love them when they're going the opposite direction that they should be. You love them when they don't love you. You love them when they uh, decided that you're no longer, uh, they're, they're no longer your friend. You love them anyway. You love your enemies. Amen. You love because God loves you. And God's love begins to flow into your heart. And that love begins to flow through you. Let me tell you something. If you can learn as a couple to begin to love like Jesus, your relationship will be different. Wow. Well, my wife and my husband did that to say. Are you loving? Are you going to love them? Well, my wife or my husband blew it. Are you going to love them? Are you going to love them? Right? See, it's not if, it's not when, it's always. And as we begin to understand this love for ourselves, you will only love your spouse or love others because you understand that God loves you and then you begin to love yourself. You can't love somebody else if you don't love yourself. If you're still thinking that God doesn't love you and you can't love yourself because of something you've done or something you're holding on to, or you think poorly of yourself, you're never going to have good agape relationships. So get a hold of God's love, people, and let's let that love cause us to flourish and to grow and to thrive. Amen? So you're going to have a great relationship if you center your relationship on Jesus Christ. Number two, if we learn how to love like Jesus, number three is this. If we create an atmosphere of love and praise. How many of you like to be in an atmosphere of love and praise? Isn't it awesome? Yeah. How many of you like to be in an atmosphere that's negative? Criticism. Negativity. Right? Sharp words. Right? Always. And nobody likes to be in that. You don't thrive in that, do you? And so God wants us to thrive, and God wants our marriage to thrive. And the way that we do that is we speak words of love. Uh, Pooky might be one of them. <laughs> Boo might be another one, I guess, right? Sweetie might be another, and Siri answers. Honey might be another. You speak words of love, right? You speak words of love, and you speak words of praise, right? It tells us in the Bible that God dwells in the praises of his people. We've always taken that to mean that our worship goes up and God's presence comes down. Well, what if that were to happen in your relationship? God dwells in the praises of God's people. What if in your marriage you began to praise that person? Your praise goes to that person, God's presence comes down. You know how to change the atmosphere of your home like that? Begin to praise. God's presence is thicker than a knife. All of a sudden, that anointing begins to flow in as you begin to praise. Amen? And so, here it says in Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love, we grow up. We All things grow unto Him who is the head, that is Christ. When we speak the truth in love. Amen? So let me, let me point this out. If you speak the truth without love, you can speak the truth without love. If you speak the truth without love, is there growth? No. You cannot speak the truth. Is there growth? No. But if you speak the truth in love, 
there is growth. And you're being built up. And so sometimes we have to have those hard conversations. This really hurt my feelings. This made me feel bad. This, I'm not sure. I'm speaking the truth, I'm speaking in love. And then you can grow together. Amen? If you don't speak, if you don't say the truth, and then you're in denial or you're avoiding, and nothing ever gets done. If you speak the truth, I feel this way, you did this, if you play the blame game like Adam and Eve, there's disapproval, there's defensiveness, there's denial, there's all these things, right? But if you speak the truth in love, from a heart of love, from a heart that comes from God, then you both will grow. Amen? It says in Ephesians 4.29, do not let unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up. That's a good word. If it's not going to build your spouse up, if it's not going to build your friend up, then why are you saying it? We need to be like David. Oh, God, put a guard over my mouth. <laughs> oh, God, put a guard over my lips. And it goes on and it says, according to their needs. Wow. Build them up according to their needs. Do you know the needs of your spouse? Do you know that they need? They need this. They need praise. They need encouragement. What is building up? It's encouragement. Can you encourage your spouse in the area of their need? Can you encourage your spouse in the area of their need? Amen. And then God will begin to bless. Amen. Okay, number four in our last thing. So number one, we're going to center our relationships on Jesus Christ. Number two, we're going to commit to learning to love like Jesus. We're not all there yet, are we? There's nobody perfect, right? We're learning. We're growing. We're figuring out what a God made love is, right? Number three, uh, we're creating an atmosphere of love and praise. We're going to let go of the criticism, let go of the judgments, let go of those things that we grew up with, right? And let's begin to love intentionally and praise and speak words that encourage. And then number four, commit to a marriage where there's no record of wrongs. Wow. Okay. Let's talk about that for a minute. Commit to a marriage where there's no record of wrongs. So you know that little page in your journal where you put everything that they did the last year? <laughs> You're going to have a little burning party. Do you know, uh, you can keep a record of wrongs really good up here, can't you? Because when, when you start getting hurt or when things don't feel like they're going your way, those little thoughts, they pop up here and you have your whole record of wrongs. Well, you did this last time. You said this last time. You acted this way last time. This is what happened last time, and you forgot that you're not supposed to be kept with keeping that record of wrong, it's fine. So what do we do? Well, it says in 1 Corinthians 13, 4 and 5, it says, Love is patient and kind. We need a lot of patience with one another, don't we? Janet has needed 33 years of patience with me. <laughs> right? Because nobody's perfect. And let's face it, you can enter into a relationship, and God can be part of that third stool, God isn't making the mistakes that the two of you can. Because you're not perfect. You're going you're gonna to blow it here. You're going to blow it there. You're going to say the wrong thing here. You're going to have a bad day here. You're going to not have grown up well in this area of your life. Or have some history from your family that you're bringing in. You know? And so we have to learn to be patient and kind with one another, don't we? And then it says, love is... Not jealous, or boastful, or proud, or rude. Love doesn't demand its own way. Wow, that's a good one. Okay, Pastor Shannon, I better remember that this week. Love doesn't demand its own way. It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wrong. So God wants us to learn how to say I'm sorry. God wants us to learn, you know, the wonderful thing about being a Christian is you feel that check in the spirit of you. When you've said something or you've done something or something's not right, the Holy Spirit is free. It says in the Bible that the Holy Spirit will give you that, you, you have that.
that thing in uh, I did that, I said that I should have done that, I should have said that. So when we go and we ask for this, what happens? It's because the Holy Spirit has convicted us. And when we ask forgiveness of one another, it says you will be healed. That's what it says in James 5. You will be healed. When we confess our sins one to another, then there's healing that takes place. So if you go through life and you're not saying I'm sorry, and you just you kind of feel bad if you never say I'm sorry and never acknowledge that in your relationship, what happens is it just kind of builds and then one day something's going to explode. Because healing isn't happening. It says in, in James 5 that when we confess our sins one to another, that's when healing comes in. Amen. So we want to do that. Okay, on the back real quick, and I'm going to close with this. We, we're blessed when we have a wonderful marriage. When God gives us that gift of a person, right? And we have enjoyment. We have... We have a partner, and this is the same with close friends. Some of you, you've had partners and they've passed away. Some of you um, are in a different stage in your life. And, and the main thing is you can apply all of these things to, to close friendships. But we all need God's love coming to us through others. Not one of us is meant to be an island, right? But what, what, what is it that God blesses us with? Well, we have people in our lives to walk with. We have people in our lives to enjoy life with. We have people so that we're not alone. We have people in our lives. That's what these relationships mean to us. But here's something else. One of the purposes that God has in giving you a spouse, and I'll put close friend there as well, in giving you a spouse or a friend who is your exact opposite is this. They help to sharpen, they help to rub off those rough edges. Because the main thing that God is concerned about is that you become more like Jesus. So sometimes you get frustrated, you say, how in the world can I have such a partner that's opposite me? I mean, it's just, we're direct opposites. Well, Janet comes from Scotland, and I grew up in South America. We're very opposite, right? Janet's an extrovert, and I'm an introvert. I process everything. I get my energy from being alone, and, and then I love to be around people. Janet gets her energy being around people. She doesn't like to be alone very often. Amen? We're exact opposites. Uh, Janet loves coffee and beer. <laughs> Actually, now she's switched. She likes tea. And she loves her chocolate. I don't really care about chocolate, although I've learned to like some because she has it all over the house. <laughs> When I first met Janet, she would put chocolate under the mattress. Oh my God. <laughs> first thing in the morning, she'd have her coffee and her little chocolate. Right? So we're exact opposites. I like spicy food. I like Mexican food. I like steak. She barely believed it. So we're the exact opposites, right? But you know what? We have a purpose in our relationship. She helps me become more like Jesus. I'm helping her. Why? Because we argue. Because we disagree. If it's all perfect, you're not iron sharpening iron, are you? So some of you think, wow, I've got so many problems in my marriage, or my spouse and I are just having such a tough time. Hmm. Somebody getting sharpened there? <laughs> You see, maybe it's not, maybe it's just part of God's way. And you need to embrace that and let, let those rough edges fall off. And let God be God in your life. Amen. That's agape love, isn't it? That's agape love, isn't it? When you can turn to your spouse at the end of 33 years and say, we don't look more like each other, but we're beginning to look a little bit more like Jesus. That's the important thing, you know? That's the important thing in life. When you have close friends, when you walk through difficult times, and you walk through hard times, and you look at each other and you think, wow, we never thought that we would be friends this long. But you know what? You're looking a lot like Jesus today. You're looking a lot like him. 
as we've been through the valley, and we've been through the mountains, and we're still friends. And God's using us to bless one another and shine for one another. Amen? Aren't you glad that Jesus lives in you? Aren't you glad that you can have good relationships? And that your relationships can get better and better, like the triangle? As you grow closer to Jesus, your relationships can get better and better, and you can become more like Him. Let's rise as you're able. Let's close in prayer this morning. Did you get something good out of today? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your agape love. God, it's, it's a love many of us didn't grow up with and understand. And now you're having to change us from the inside out. We give you permission to renew our minds. We give you permission to transform us. We give you permission to transform our relationships, our friendships, our family, church family relationships. We give you permission to speak the truth in love. God, let your God in love abound in our friendships, in our church family. Let it abound in every marriage, every marriage relationship. Let that agape love of forgiveness, of kindness, of patience, let that agape love that's consistent and unconditional, let it be the foundation of our church, let it be the foundation of our marriages, let it be the foundation of our relationships.